you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Passage I've preached some from, I'm sure, before. And, but as we, uh, as we near the, the season of, of Easter and the time that we celebrate the resurrection, I, I sort of set out some things I wanted to preach on. And I think I, um, Lord seems to always direct my mind toward those things. At this time of year, and last uh, last week I did preach on uh, uh, his uh, sort of the Last Supper and uh, the time of the betrayal and uh, some of those things. Next week, Lord willing, I hope to preach on the crucifixion. And uh, Easter Sunday, I will preach on the resurrection. And uh, what a what a day that uh, is to you and I as a believer. The resurrection day, uh, the fact that Christ came out of the tomb and we serve a risen Savior. And this week, I. I desire to preach to you on the subject of atonement and uh, an interesting word in our Bible and um, an interesting doctrine within our Bible. And sometimes I don't think uh, churches, uh, uh, surely uh, pastors and stuff uh, in the day and age in which we live don't do much uh, to instruct or to, uh, to preach on those things about our faith and the doctrines we have and those things once delivered and uh, as far as the faith, but uh, the doctrine of atonement and the the blood atonement in in except or in speciality of what Christ did, but also his substitutionary death and what they are to us, because without them we have nothing. Uh, without what he did on the cross of Calvary, our salvation would have been incomplete and would have been non-existent. And of course, uh, we again had to have all of the elements of it: the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But we see some of those things as we think on the subject of atonement and just titled it that, but we could have probably titled it a couple other things. But I want to think on that word for a little bit this morning, and I want to give you some things about it. But reading out of Romans 5 this morning, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man would some even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgressions, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Let us pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the day, for what you've given to us. Thankful for a time that we can gather in your house. Father, I ask now that you might bless the preaching of your word. I pray that you'll help me, that you might fill me with the power of your spirit. Help me to preach those things you've laid on my heart. Father, I pray that it might encourage us, that it might help us to realize what was done on our behalf, and that all who hear may know you in a personal way and realize uh, of what Jesus did just for them. Lord, again, we ask that you'll bless our time together, be with the class in the back, help the young kids to learn more about you. Father, we just ask that you'll bless our time. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The subject of atonement as given in Scripture, uh, we read the only place you'll find that word written uh, in the New Testament, and that's in verse 11, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 5. Romans is sometimes a little hard of a book to separate because you start reading in one chapter and it's really all connected. It was one letter, obviously separated in paragraphs and those things. But again, those thoughts and all those 
uh, again, continuing things continue on as Paul gives us really our statement of faith on our salvation, if you will, throughout the book of Romans. And he begins by telling us the world was condemned under sin. He does that in the first uh, three chapters. But then he begins to explain what was done on our behalf by Christ. <coughs> and again, what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary to take our place. And we're going to separate just a couple of those thoughts today and think upon specifically concerning his atonement and the blood atonement and what that means to you and I. And I think it can be a blessing to us. It should be a blessing to us because as we think again of what Jesus did, uh, these things were uh, are found in Scripture and what it is. And so, and I know I've probably given some of this before, but I always like to give some background concerning some things, especially a word like this. Atonement is found several times in the Old Testament. As we said, only found here once in the New Testament. Referred to in action a couple of places, but only found uh, one time here in the in the New Testament in Romans 5, 11. The first mention of atonement is in Exodus 29 and verse 33. And uh, that goes back when, again, it was instituted to the children of Israel and some of their sacrifices. They were to make atonement, and it was to make atonement for something. Uh, the Hebrew word it comes from is called kafar, if I pronounce that close to right. It was uh, first used uh, in your Bible as it was translated into another word. And that word uh, has an interesting meaning in its time and as well, and it makes an interesting study because you can begin to put maybe some of that together. But that word was first translated as the word pitch uh, back in the account of Noah and the ark in Genesis when it talked about the things that Noah was to do to protect the ark from leaking, and he was to pitch it within and without. And so whatever substance that they used or tar-like dill or anything that they maybe put around that, this word kafar meant that same as that particular word that was translated pitch. It came out of that Hebrew word, but it had that meaning of what it was to do. Again, protect as a covering to seal it from the water and to seal what was inside of it. It's an interesting picture. And uh, the ark is its own account, but that particular word was used in the Bible. I enjoy my old Bible and the words it has and the, the really just the, the majesty that we find within Scripture and we find what it has uh, within that as we seek some of that. But that word pitch is, it comes from the same Hebrew word that atonement comes from. You'll also find your Bible that 27 times, if you uh, look that up and state it out, I did take somebody's word for it because I did not count those, uh, but it's translated mercy seat. And the mercy seat was that particular top part of the Ark of the Covenant, the box that the children of Israel carried around when God led them through the wilderness. And then they would erect the tabernacle where they would go and they would build that tent. Well, within that middle section, that Holy of Holies, that they would only enter to, into at a certain time. And you may remember the stories concerning the Ark and the different things about it, sometimes taken in battle and uh, the things that would cause the enemies of, of the Israelites when they took it, or the Philistines and others, the man who touched it who died because that wasn't God's way and it had some specific uh, dealings in the way they were to move it. But the priests were to carry it around. And that particular box covered in gold had a top on it. And that top had the two cherubims that their wings touched and uh, it came about, but we call that part the mercy seat. This word uh, atonement, as it's translated much, but kafar is translated mercy seat in 27 times in the Old Testament. The meaning of it is kafar, and the only two words that are translated atonement in your, in your Old Testament would be kafar and kippur. And it has these meanings that come with it. And think on these as I give you. There are several things that it, it involves there, and the, this word can mean that when it's given to that in the Bible. And the first one is to cover. The second is to expiate, to expiate, to placate, to cancel, to appease, to cleanse, to disannul, to forgive, to be merciful, to pacify, to pardon, to reconcile, to make atonement, or to purge. All those definitions and all those words give us a picture of what atonement was in the Old Testament. It's interesting that it's not mentioned maybe as much in the New Testament, but yet the method or the things that we pointed to and to follow are mentioned much and uh, don't completely have time to, to get into that. The Israelites would actually use it on a particular day that it came as part of their worship in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 14. And I'll, I'll read that one for you as we turn back. 
and again, uh, not taking a lot of time maybe to, to look in particular uh, to where all it's mentioned in the Old Testament, just uh, again, a number of times and references that you will find in the Old Testament, especially through uh, the uh, Pentateuch and the, the books of Moses as it was instituted there. But in Leviticus 16 and verse 14, you will find it says, And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. And uh, then it goes down and it talks about sprinkling it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat at the end of verse 15 as well. And so uh, this describing some of the things that the children of Israel would do, and it actually would come to be mentioned even as the Day of Atonement of what the children of Israel were to do, a ceremony that was to take place within in them that involved the placing of blood of an animal that they had sacrificed and offered to God upon the mercy seat. Now, what it did in the Old Testament, that Day of Atonement, uh, is probably given to us in no better place than a place in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, uh, sometimes the Hebrew book of Hebrews can be a little bit of a, uh, maybe a mystery to some. We, we look at it and we think, well, you know, it's got all this uh, uh, sort of, it makes reference to the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it opens the Old Testament to us because we look at some of those things that we read in the Old Testament about what the Israelites did. And it's like, how in the world does that apply to us today? How in the world does that get to where what they did? Because God had so many of those things, those days and those sacrifices and those things that they did. All of them in, in Casey's point spiritually uh, to the things to come and the things that we no longer necessarily do, but what Christ did for us and what Jesus performed. And atonement was one of those that was sort of a very high and holy day because it was the day once a year that a high priest would go into the holiest of holies, that inner part of the tabernacle, and would face the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and place that pure sacrificial blood upon the mercy seat. And what that would do on that Day of Atonement is that it literally would buy them another year of their transgressions paid for. It would atone for what was done. And God would meet them there. And uh, interesting that he met at a place called the mercy seat. Also interesting is within that Ark, the ark contained some things, and one of the things that it contained at one time was the tablets of the law. The mercy covered those things that we were held accountable with, the law of God that was our schoolmaster that showed us that we were sinners, and the mercy that came over that, and the blood that would be applied there of just an animal representing the blood of things to come. And it would cover that, and the children of Israel, within that particular ceremony, their sins, again, pacified, uh, taken care of, covered for one more time, one more day, one more year, actually, as they would only do that once a year. But we read about that ceremony in Hebrews chapter 9, and I'll read you another little bit lengthy of a passage because it covers some of those things, and we'll see particular about what that he did. In Hebrews 9 and verse 1, it says, Then ver verily the first covenant also had ordinance, had also ordinances, <coughs> excuse me, a divine service, and a worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That was the first part the priest would go into. And after the second veil is the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when those things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. That's what they did on a daily. They would come in, they would go in that first part, they would do things that God had commanded, the particular furniture and all that, that the priests would uh, offer some incense, do some things. But he would only, again, as it explains to us in verse 7, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Uh, just to stop here for a second, uh, the author of Hebrews, and I believe it was the Apostle Paul, he's beginning to explain, he's explaining to the Jews, 
And he's about to connect their Old Testament ceremony with what was performed by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. I, I actually find these pieces of scripture uh, very, uh, very interesting, not just interesting, but, but actually I think they just explain a lot and they give us an idea and a picture. And as we read through here, pick up of what it's saying. It's told us what the priest did in the Old Testament one day a year that he sprinkled that blood. Now it's about to bring us forward to a new time and that time, and it's actually speaking of a spiritual act that took place, I think as a spiritual act as well as a, a, a physical act as, as much as could be uh, made in the realm of God. I can't say I can explain all that, but I do think that, uh, again, that it took place in a tabernacle uh, in heaven because we had an earthly tabernacle. There is one that appeared there, but we see what Jesus did as we read the rest of this. In verse 9, it says, which was a figure for time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that cannot make him that did the sacrifice, the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. And so again, it was given some of that and it says quite a bit. I know we read that and it gets a little bit basically saying it couldn't make the priest perfect. He had to do that every year. It didn't completely take everything away. It rolled it away for one year. It atoned it for a matter of time. It had a limited amount of time. In this case, a year. He had to do that every year for the people and for himself. And then it begins to explain. And you always uh, sort of enjoy in Scripture when you see a verse begin, but Christ, but the Lord. In this case, it says in verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered into once, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify unto the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressors, transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. I'll skip down to verse 24. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. And um, if we continued on uh, to verse 28, as it closed out, it said, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And so uh, Paul, as he writes in Hebrews, he gives us an explanation of what took place in the Old Testament, what that priest did. And of course, again, that was a, uh, cutting through maybe a lot of the ceremony as you read your Bible in the Old Testament, you see that there was much that would go on those days, that the priest had a lot of requirements, a lot of things that he was required to do to just be able to take that blood in, the way that he would dress, the particular garments he would put on to cleanse himself, things that were done on the outside and some of the other furniture connected with the tabernacle, all that he was again given to do that he might bring that particular blood of that animal that was given on sacrifice and take it on a day of atonement and atone for the sins of the people. Again, it was a temporary atonement. Hebrews tells us this spiritually speaking. And again, this is what happened. And as our mind's eye sort of envisions, it may be hard to completely imagine all these things that took place, but the Bible tells us they do. They did, and, and I can't say I can explain all that, but I believe what the Bible says, that within the tabernacle in heaven, that literally sometime after Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that his blood spiritually was presented in the tabernacle in heaven and applied to a mercy seat there that appeased God for all mankind for all time. Past, present, and future sins atoned for at one moment in time by something much more perfect than the blood of animals and those that were pure and unspotted from the, the best that they took. But now we have the sinless Son of God who would present His blood in the holy place in heaven and make atonement or a covering once for all 
for the sins of man. And matter of fact, when we think again of that definition of that Hebrew word atonement where we find so much of it in the New Testament here as we see it, it has an implication and, and talks about uh, when we see it in Romans 5 and verse 11 about being reconciled and about the fact that God has reconciled man unto him. But when we think of the Old Testament of what that definition said that it applied, it meant to cover, to expiate, to placate, to cancel, to appease, to cleanse, to disannul, to forgive, to be merciful, to pacify, to pardon, to reconcile, to make atonement, to purge. That Jesus Christ, with his own blood, would pay the sin debt of all mankind. And I think as, as much as it took place on earth with the high priest in the Old Testament, that in the New Testament, the death of the testator would present his blood perfect and pure and sinless on the mercy seat of God, providing salvation to all who would come and trust him. One of those great acts that we see within Scripture, the blood atonement and the sacrificial death of Christ. And that's why when we look out and we see and we begin to see a picture of the cross, how that that is the focus of all that takes place in your Bible. The Old Testament looking forward to it. The New Testament worshiping and looking back to it for all that's been done. And the fact that God's Son came into this world in the flesh that He might pay that sin debt with His blood and provided on the cross of Calvary. We sometimes maybe lose track of that and we may look at the punishments and I will speak on those things next week and preach on those and hope to do that about all that was done to Christ when he went to the cross and as he uh, made that journey there and all the human things that they were inflicted upon him and how awful they were. But more than just that, it was the Godward side of the cross that that's what he lamented at over in the garden. That's what he sweat drops of blood for, the breaking of the fellowship that that cup might pass from him because it was at that moment on Calvary, I believe in those dark hours, that God would do the thing that only God could do and that Jesus Christ, again, holding accountable all of mankind in one place at one time and God would place the sins of all mankind upon his only son, on the cross of Calvary. Now I can't completely say I can understand that. I can believe what the Bible tells me. It uses the word impute, which means ascribe true to, and it means to be given to his account. And in other words, when Jesus hung on the cross, my sin debt, everything that I've ever done, everything that I will ever do, the sins I'll commit today, tomorrow, the things that I will do against Christ the, the doubting of my faith or the letting down of, of other things that maybe I should do when I know to do right and do them wrong. Other things that will happen. And I'm just saying, I'm a sinful man. I understand that. And as we look back, all the things that are in our past, all of those things that we find that hold us guilty before God of knowing that we're a sinner and those commands and rules of God that were given in the Bible, they're our schoolmaster to show that we are under sin. And that's what Paul uh, does in the first part of Romans is shows the world that we're under sin, but it shows us that one paid the debt and paid the price by a sacrifice and by his blood atonement. He took your place on the cross of Calvary. He paid your debt on the cross of Calvary. He paid my debt. He paid everybody out there we can look in the world, no matter whose name we come up with, no matter how wicked we think they are, no matter how wicked of a life they live, their sin debt was placed upon the only begotten Son of God on the cross of Calvary. His blood would spiritually be taken. However that happened, again, I think physically, spiritually, every which way, I think it happened as Scripture says it, presented in heaven, and probably in a moment in time from death to the time it was presented, that Jesus would place an offering on the mercy seat in heaven that would pay the sin debt of all mankind. The Bible explains that and Paul gives that. And we call it simply, they called it atonement in the Old Testament. It's mentioned as an atonement here, but more so is just again the, the sacrifice and the fact of his blood. And Paul repeats that time and time again, that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. You know, if Jesus had only uh, swooned away, as some say on the cross, and 
they were able to take him down and nurse him back to life as uh, some of the uh, deniers of the crucifixion, deniers of Christianity say, we have no salvation. If by some reason he chose not to go and he was only a moral man or just lived a good life, we have nothing in that. If Jesus was a sinful man, and even though he contained and lived in the sinful flesh, yet without sin, and I say the sinful flesh, he had the, the body of Adam. Matter of fact, taking on the name and the title of the second Adam, that he might fulfill what the first Adam failed at, plunging all mankind into sin. The second Adam would come and complete that and finish those things, and he would be the one that nailing him to the cross wasn't just the end of it all. It was the blood that was shed, the sacrifice that was made, and the Godward side of Calvary that saved us and what was done in that transaction there. And again, it comes to all men everywhere that as we read in Romans, that by not as the offense, for so also is the free gift. For through the offense of many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. That's simply saying many died, many can come and receive a free gift. And they can trust in Christ. He paid the price for all men and did that. But what else does atonement mean for you and I as Paul writes in uh, Romans chapter 5? As a matter of fact, this is sort of picking apart our salvation. And I won't have time to fully expound on these things this morning. But I want to give you some things that are mentioned in this chapter. What does it do for us? What has it done? And I think it'll be a blessing. I think it is a blessing. And I think all of that, when we just think for a moment of what Jesus did, and it only takes a simple transaction of faith, believing on him, trusting in what he did, that we might be saved. But to the saved, the atonement has brought to us some things. Paul starts this uh, particular thing. As a matter of fact, if you backed up, there's a lot of explanation. He ends up actually with a word in verse 25 of chapter 4, but he says, therefore being justified by faith. The first thing that we find that atonement did for us is it justified us as a sinner. And to be justified means that I no longer have my sin as accountable to me. It was, he took my place. He paid my debt. You know, even in simple things, we may understand if uh, somebody's ever paid for you uh, for something that you didn't know about. I don't know if you've ever been surprised. You go up to uh, pay a bill or to do something, and they look at you and they say, it's already been paid. Like, well, who paid? Oh, me who paid. You know, and, uh, you know, they won't tell you, but they did that. And somebody just done that being nice. But we've probably all at one time or another had somebody do something. Somebody bought us dinner we didn't know about. They've seen us across the restaurant, done a nice thing. They bought us and they paid for something. We didn't do anything for it. Can't do anything to fix it, replace it. You accept it and go on. We understand a little bit about that. Justification is so much more. And even though it's a spiritual term, but it means that God views me just as if I've never sinned. And it's not because of the things that I've done. It's not because I preach. It's not because I've been a Christian for a while. It's not because of anything else. It's not because of church membership or baptism. It's due to nothing of that nature. It's due to what Jesus did for me and the blood that he shed. I'm justified in the eyes of God because I've trusted in him and believed on him just as if I've never sinned. That's an easy way to think of a definition for that. I'm justified in the eyes of God. These chapters explain justification. Secondly, it says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, interesting, that word pitch we talked about with Noah's Ark. There's a great say there, but it holds back again God's wrath on the world. Those in the ark were protected. That word pitch that came from that same word that atonement comes from held back that particular things that protected those inside the ark. You and I have peace with God now. Not because we could broker it, but because it was done by one who took our place. He gave us peace with God. We have that now. We have grace through faith, God's unmerited favor. And it all comes because of a transaction of faith. Not again the works that we perform, but again by believing in Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary. Personally trusting Him as my Savior by that simple transaction of faith. Grace is extended unto me. I can't earn God's grace. It's given to me. 
It's a gift. The grace of God, his unmerited favor given unto a sinner such as I, a sinner such as you and anybody else we can find in this world, a sinner such as them. Grace by faith. It says in verse 2 also that it gives us hope and uh, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I have a home in heaven. I have things beyond this world. I have hope. Not because again of what I can do, but because of the atonement, the blood atonement, the sacrifice of Christ, what He did for me. It says that I have the love of God by the Holy Ghost shed abroad in my heart in verse 5. And again, that's something that we have. And we could probably even pick out some more things out of this. I picked out seven because I like that number. It's a good number in the Bible. But we have the love of God that's given unto us. Oh, what a change that we had when we came to Christ. And the more and closer we go to Him, I hope your love for God and your love for others grows in your heart. And it's because of something in you that was placed there, something you couldn't go out and buy. The things of this world didn't fill that spot, but trusting in Christ filled that God-placed void in our hearts. And the Holy Ghost now resides in us. And it gives us a love for God, but it gives us a love for others that again is a test of sonship and a mark of that. And we have that again because it was given unto us. In verse 9, it says it was saved from wrath. That again, the wrath and the judgment of God is no longer upon us. And some will say, well, do we serve an angry God? Is he waiting? No, but we serve a righteous God who it says that those who don't accept his son and the gift of that, they face the wrath of God and that the wrath of God will be upon them. And you and I have fallen outside of that, not because again of what we did, but because of a belief in Christ and, and being born into the family of God, that we are no longer under the wrath of God and that we're saved from wrath through him. Are we thankful for that? And we enjoy that word saved because of what it means to us. Okay. Lastly, in verse 15, it says, but again, we have a free gift, the gift by grace of God, a free gift given to you and I and given to all who will come and trust. You know, again, some of you may look out and say, well, I've never had a gift given to me. I've never had anything that was given that, you know, maybe I earned it or I didn't get. No, you truly can't say there's not a person in the world. They may can say I haven't had a gift in this world. I haven't had something given to me by somebody I didn't know that done something special for me. But you know what? The Bible tells us that everybody can look out and you've got at least one free gift that's been given to you. It's not a gimmick. It's not anything else. Somebody else did something on your behalf that there's no way you can make a payment for. There's no way you can earn it. There's no way you can do anything else to do. It's a free gift with no strings attached except that you trust in Christ and believe on Him. And it's already been paid for. And it was paid with the greatest price ever, the death of the Son of God on the cross of Calvary. The blood atonement and His substitutionary death he took your place. He shed his blood that you might be saved and to give you a free gift. The atonement, an interesting word in your New Testament, many times in your old, but an event that took place on the cross that only Christ could do. But he did it for you. He did it for all others. May we take the wonderful message of the substitutionary death and the blood atonement and tell others about it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and he gave him that he might die, that he might meet the needs of all sinners everywhere, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. May that be a blessing to us as we think on those things. Matter of fact, he's armed you as a Christian with all those blessings and many more that we read there. And it ought to rejoice us to know what God has done on our behalf. And it was free, a gift to all. This morning, I hope you know Christ and I hope you've had the atonement as a personal uh, testimony of those things that Jesus has done in your heart by trusting him as Savior. I hope you know him today. Let us stand with our heads bowed as we close our time together.